So welcome everybody. I'm Steve Zralski, president of Cablecast Community Media, a division of Tightrope Media Systems. Uh, we are going to talk about what's new in Cablecast uh, coming up, um, some things that we've just released and some things that are coming up. Um, Ray's going to talk about that. Sean, who is our inside sales manager, he's going to talk about cloud distribution solutions. Um, and then we have a special announcement on closed captioning that we're going to get into later in the presentation. And after that, we are going to do a Q&A. And then finally, at the end of the day, five o'clock uh, or thereabouts, um, we want to hear your thoughts, your ideas, drink, drink a beer, drink a wine, kick back, and uh, talk about the business. So um, without further ado, uh, let's get started. Ray. Sweet. Finding my mute button. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Ray Tiley. I know a lot of you, but uh, I am senior engineer or head of engineering on the Cablecast team. And I'm going to show you what's new, some of it which is already out and a lot of people are already using, and a sneak peek at some things to come. So uh, let's hop right in. Um, so I'm notorious for not doing slides. So I have about three slides, and they're one topic each, and then I'm just going to dump into, jump into some demos. Um, so the first thing that we want to talk about a little bit uh, during this is our network stream support in Cablecast 7.1. Um, so if you haven't checked out the 7.1 webinar, I highly recommend it. We talk a lot about the network streams, um, and I can't really, uh, I, I did not anticipate how timely the network stream support in Cablecast 7.1 would be. Um, we were adding it because we wanted to, and we did a lot of work to add all these things. And then, um, you know, the, the world uh, turned upside down on us all. And um, the ability to kind of pull in these live streams from different sources has been um, overwhelmingly useful in the current age. Um, so, uh, so what is a network stream? Um, so it's uh, a, a video over IP that uh, your Cablecast system can pull in. Um, and we added a bunch of support for different network streams in Cablecast 7.1, specifically uh, HLS, which is uh, HTTP live streaming. Um, we added support for RTMP, uh, which is a, a flash protocol, but it is ubiquitous. Um, so many things support RTMP. Um, we also added RTSP. Um, and then we added a beta YouTube live feature uh, which allows us to pull live streams from YouTube. Um, that one is a little bit in beta because sort of cat and mouse with YouTube. Uh, if they change their APIs too much, we have to scramble to catch up. It's not something they officially support, uh, but it's been really useful. Um, a lot of uh, you know, local governments or state governments have been doing um, live press updates every day, and we have a bunch of customers that are taking those directly from YouTube using Cablecast 7.1 without having to uh, to figure out another way to do it. Um, so let's jump into the software and kind of see what network streaming looks like. Minimize Chrome here. So we'll hop into Cablecast here. Um, so creating a network stream is really easy. Uh, just come into uh, settings, location settings, and under your IO tab, you have network streams. You can see I have a bunch of different types of streams here. Um, this is my development server, so there's just a ton. Um, to create a new stream, uh, you just hit new, give it a name. And then uh, pick the type of stream. So we uh, support multiple different types of HLS, RTMP, RTSP, YouTube beta, and RTP. Um, and we are actively developing and going to be releasing to our beta sites pretty soon. Uh, the ability to play NDI streams from new tech. So that will be coming um, in a couple weeks or months with the release of 7.2. Um, sort of depends on how the world unfolds uh, exactly when that comes out. So I can't give any promises, but it is something that we are actively working on right now and I can promise will be out in the next version of Cablecast 7.2. Um, so you pick the type of stream you want. Um, and then you just enter in the, the URL for it. So for instance, if I had um, uh, an M3U8 HLS stream, I can just put that in, I go ahead and save it. And now there's a couple different ways I could schedule it. 
Um, I could either force it out live using the force matrix. So for instance, for instance here I am in the force matrix. Um, I have a bunch of streams here. Um, I hit play stream and then I can do something like uh, free speech. So free speech TV that airs democracy now. There are streams available as an HLS. Um, we have a bunch of people that switched from uh, satellites to free speech's HLS stream to do democracy now every morning. Um, so there's our HLS stream of, I have no idea who this is, but it's free speech. Um, another stream that uh, a bunch of stations are starting to use is uh, classic arts. So for a little bit of uh, classic arts filler content, they also have an HLS stream. And uh, once that kind of switches over it after it buffers a little bit, we can see we're airing classic arts now. Um, the other uh, big use case for this um, is what we're doing on Cablecast right now, which Sean is going to get into in a little bit, which is taking RTMP streams. Uh, using our new screen move live service, uh, you can take an RTMP stream from something like Zoom, um, and that's super useful. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what I have to talk about uh, network streams. I'm sure we'll get a bunch of questions about it, um, but definitely check out the 7-1 webinar that we did recently um, and uh, look for the upcoming release announcements about 7-2 for uh, things like NDI support. Sorry, the Zoom window is definitely getting in my way. All right, so the next thing I wanna talk about is uh, closed caption sidecar files. Um, so closed caption sidecar files are a way to add closed captioning to your shows and cablecast without having to worry about um, getting the captions in the video correctly. What, how sidecar files work is the captions are encoded into a separate file that sits alongside your video server. Um, and how this works in cablecast is if you're used to linking up shows with show ID dash file name, uh, you just put the sidecar file either in SCC or an MCC sidecar file right along the video file and Cablecast will automatically pick it up and play it back for you uh, whenever you schedule that file. Um, so what this looks like, say on your video server, is if, uh, for instance, here I am in a VIO server, I have this show here, 35, it's today's Democracy Now! and Democracy Now! includes an SCC file that you can download. So there's no captions in the MP4 file but you can download the SCC file from Democracy Now! And this looks like a bunch of gibberish. Um, so go ahead and open that up so everyone can see it. It's just a bunch of time code with a bunch of encoded closed caption data. So a bunch of hex codes. Um, but what Cablecast can do is it can take those sidecar files and it detects them. So I'm gonna go here to digital file management, open up this, this uh, show, it detects them as valid closed captions. And anytime you play that file, it will include those captions. And those captions are included with video on demand. So for instance, if we go look at this show in the video on demand section, we can play it. it's today's democracy now. If we skip ahead a little bit past the intro, we can turn on the closed captions and they, they just work. Um, what's really nice about this is how easy it is to kind of switch things out or to get captions after the fact. So if you already have a file, instead of having to transfer that entire file and then get someone to close caption it and then get the closed caption back, figure out how to mux it into or retranscode the file with the closed captions, potentially tying up something like an edit station, you can just drop the text file with the closed captions directly onto your video server or upload them through our web interface. And then it's just all done for you. Um, Lots of services uh, uh, will generate compatible closed caption files with Cablecast. Specifically, these are SCC, uh, which is a scene artist file, and MCC, which is a Mac caption file. Um, and uh, you'll hear probably a little bit more about sidecar files uh, a little bit later um, in our special closed captioning announcement. Um, but this has been great. I've actually been really surprised by how many people have started using sidecar files already because it just makes the workflow so much faster. Um, and you know, it's really great for accessibility um, and you know, serving our community is to be able to get these captions on our programs quickly and easily.
So those are the two things that are already out there. Anyone that updates to seven one that has either a, a VIO or a Flux server can get these features. Um, there's a bunch of other features in seven one. I highly recommend again checking out our seven one webinar uh, where we kind of cover all the seven one features. But what I want to do now is is kind of talk about something new that's coming that no one's seen yet. Um, so let's go ahead and get into the sneak peek. Um, so we're going to talk about playback files. So um, we're all really used to just dropping a file on our video server with Cablecast 7.1. You can just upload that through the, the interface or 7.0. Um, and you can get the file on your server very easily. And for shows that have a single file and the file's all edited and ready to go, that's been a great workflow and it's really easy to do. Um, the problem comes when you sort of need to make changes or edits to the file, or you want to use the file in, um, more than one reel, or you want to use the same file from multiple shows. Um, that's, you know, always been a really kind of pain point in Cablecast because our, our, the way we link up files to uh, shows is through the file name. And if that file doesn't have the exact right name, it just won't link up. Um, so we've kind of been thinking about this problem and we've wanted to solve it for a while, um, but there's always been kind of some technical hurdles that prevented us from doing the solution we really wanted to. Over the past few years, we've been kind of knocking those hurdles out, and I'm really happy with kind of where we ended up with. So I want to show it to you. So I'm going to come in here to uh, one of my show records, or I'm going to create a brand new show record. So um, I'm in a brand new show. I don't know the show ID yet, but I already know there's a file on my video server for it. So I'm going to call this my awesome long meeting. Um, and just for uh, demonstration purposes, I'm going to use the uh, democracy now file that's already on my video server. Um, so I'm going to set my reel to video server. And now I'm going to select a file and I can start searching in this list for all the files on my video server and get uh, a list of files back by name. And even though this file that, you know, was in that democracy now I was just playing, it's already linked up to a different show. For this demo, I want to use it. That's the file I want to use. And I can just go ahead and select that file. And so I can do that for a second reel too. So I'll go ahead and select that file for the second reel. So this is really powerful because now you can use the same file in multiple spots. So imagine you do government meetings and you want to put the same kind of disclaimer on all your meetings. You have a 30 second clip that says, you know, the views represented here are not rep are not representative of someone, or you want to give them a static slate that tells them how they can submit questions to the city council or tells them about their trash pickup cycle, whatever you want to do. You can use that same file over and over and over again on all your shows just by linking it as the first reel in your show record. So that just by itself gives us a lot of flexibility in how we schedule and create shows for playback and cablecast. But the next feature is the one I'm, I'm really excited about. Because before, if you did a really long government meeting and they took a two hour break in the middle, the real only way to, to deal with that is to open that file in VLC, create multiple reels, duplicate the file on your disk so you can cut the middle out or just load the file in a nonlinear editor and cut the middle out. There's really no great way of, of only playing the parts of the meeting that were relative without doing a lot of extra work. Um, so in uh, Cablecast 7.2, what we have is if the file is playable in a web browser, we can pipe that through to the browser for you and offer you this trim button. So this will load up the video in uh, HTML5 video player, and I can go ahead and seek around it. So say I know that the you know, meeting started about 10 minutes in. I can seek to that point just by dragging the play bar. I can find the spot I, the spot I want and hit mark in. And then I can seek around, I can play, I can hear the audio. This is just a normal video in a web browser. I can kind of find the end of it where I want, you know, my executive session ended or they come back, the meeting is back in progress and I can hit mark out. And now this reel is timed just the way I want it. And now for this, uh, the second part of the meeting, you know, after their second break, I can hit trim on it. It's the same file, but I'm just going to mark a different part of it. 
for use in my record. And at this point, you can see I have playback file 35, playback file 35. I'm going from in point 10 minutes to out point 21 minutes and in point 42 minutes to out point 52 minutes. All in all, I'm playing a 21 minute show made up of two reels. I save this file, send autopilot, hit it for VOD. Um, the VOD will automatically cut out the parts. The, when it's scheduled via autopilot, autopilot will automatically play the right parts of the file, all with me out having to do anything outside of the Cablecast software. Um, there are some caveats. So these files need to be playable in a web browser, which means they need to be H.264 with AAC audio and they need to have, they need to be what's called streamable, which means they have the header in the right part of the file. Um, and Cablecast takes care of that for you with any files that are recorded in H.264 on your VIO or Flex server. So this means any file that you're recording H.264 on your VIO or Flex server will be available to like immediately trim this way in the Cablecast interface without having to do any post-processing after recording it on your server. Um, for files that you create yourself and want to upload and need to trim, um, as long as the, the file is made for streaming, which most files are these days, you will be able to, to do this seeking behavior. So um, I'm really excited. This is something that we've wanted to do for a really long time get people to be able to preview and trim files right in the web browser. And uh, we have finally done, you know, enough of the work in the past year or two to, to make it come together quite nicely. So uh, I'm sure I'll have lots of questions about this later. Um, but uh, I'll hand it off to the next person at this point. Thanks. Thanks, Ray. Sean, you're up. Great. Hey, everyone. Uh, Sean from uh, Inside sales of Cablecast, I've probably talked to you a lot about Assurance or Reflect, uh, but I was, I'm here to talk to you guys about ScreenLeave Live and some of the other awesome cloud distribution solutions that we have available for you guys. Um, the most exciting one is new, um, ScreenLeave Live, which uh, especially comes in handy with um, a lot of you guys doing remote meetings now, either through Zoom or WebEx or Skype. Um, so we're excited to announce that with ScreenLeave Live, it makes it a lot easier to take those Zoom meetings or other remote meetings, pipe it through our cloud-based RTMP server, and bring it over to, it's I was muted. Oh, was it not muted? Oh. Um, and then bring it over to uh, uh, YouTube or Facebook Live or Cablecast, then you can stream to your channels. Um, um, so let me show you right now how easy it is to take advantage of that. Um, I'm here on my Cablecast server, and let's say that I want to rebroadcast this very Zoom meeting. I can come over here uh, to Autopilot, go into Force Matrix. Uh, I have my playback right here. What I can do is I can hit Action. I can play Stream, just like Ray showed earlier. And I can take the Zoom meeting that we're doing right now and switch that to the output and hit Take. Uh, it's buffering on the back end here, but in a moment, we'll be able to see through a Cablecast feature in 7.1, the confidence monitor, that it's switching over from bulletin board over to this Zoom meeting right now live. Um, so I would be able to stream this out to my cable channels, to my live streamer, um, as well as the ability to switch it over to um, Facebook Live or YouTube, um, all through ScreenWeave Live. Um, and I can show on the public site this very thing working. As you can see, we have the... Uh, this takes a moment, but uh, Michelle, did you want to quickly plug the uh, um, karaoke yeah. on Friday? Oh, you're blowing my secret, Sean. Um, <laughs> so for those, for those watching on demand, um, you're going to have to switch over to the slideshow while we wait for this. Um, so yeah, well, we kill time and wait for our streaming server to pick up the stream from Zoom. I just wanted to let you all know that we are not forgetting about the party. Um, we still want to have some actual social time with you. So in addition to uh, hanging out afterwards today, because we know some people might just be like totally zoomed out um, by the end of this, 
we are also going to try to start doing some karaoke over Zoom, and we're going to try that out on Friday, and we'll be using ScreenWeave Live to bring that all over the place uh, across platform and you can again I'll be sharing the link that you're seeing on the slide here in the chat but um, you can sign up for that we're giving you guys first dibs because um, there will be a sign up sheet for people who want to sing and there will just be one little app that you have to sign up for so that we can all sync up our video playback for the karaoke tracks but I think it's going to be fun and if it works out if people like it we will bring it back as like a regular weekly thing i think so i hope you all can join us um i'm sorry it's not our regular happy hour at the fireside lounge but this is what we decided to try in uh in this new virtual reality that we're in right now so um i again i will put the link to this in the chat and i will also have it in our follow-up email and now I think we're probably ready to see if the live stream is picked up. Yeah, so I'm um, going get the Zoom UI out of the way. So yeah, as you can see, um, the Zoom meeting is live here on our um, public site. Um, so it's super easy to bring those Zoom meetings over to um, your broadcast, Facebook Live or YouTube. Um, but it, it uh, doesn't uh, end just there with uh, Zoom. Um, it also is possible, like I said earlier, if all those other platforms, Skype, Microsoft Teams, uh, WebEx, Google Hangouts, whatever you use, uh, it can also be brought over as well through uh, using a free piece of software called OBS. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details now about how to do that. Um, all this information is available on our knowledge base by going to support.cablecast.tv. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about ScreenWave Live, feel free to send an email to sales at cablecast.tv. Um, just a couple of quick things uh, for software um, that can take advantage of this. Uh, if you guys are on a Flex or a VIO server running 7.1, you can do it right through your um, Cablecast interface. If you're on a Flex server that's on 6.6 .6 or older, that's okay, you can use it too by taking advantage of Carousel. Carousel has the ability to show RTMP video streams through um, a dynamic bulletin. Uh, so you can take advantage of that on there as well. SX servers um, unfortunately cannot take advantage of the network feeds uh, that um, Ray mentioned earlier, but doesn't mean you can't take advantage of taking your Zoom meetings and bring it to air. Same deal, you'd use Carousel for doing a dynamic bulletin for an RTMP feed and making it an alert bulletin, uh, full screen alert. Uh, again, all this can be reiterated on our support website, support.cablecast.tv. Um, you guys are probably curious about pricing for using ScreenWeave Live. Uh, we have two options for all of you. If it's something you want to try out and see if it works for you, there is a three-month trial that is available for $360 for the three months. After the three months, you can either renew it for the one year, renew it every three months, or um, if it's not working out for you, you don't have to continue it. Uh, and then there's the one-year option, uh, so you're good for one whole year. And both of these options give you 100 gigabytes a month which equates out to roughly 40 hours of meetings at five megabytes per second. Um, so that's those options. Um, we did mention it last year at the previous NAB, uh, just reiterating that the options are still available for taking your streams and video on demand content and bring it to over the top channels. What this means is bringing it to Roku and Apple TV. Um, so uh, that's still an option. Uh, but in addition to being able to bring it to OTT, uh, you can still do custom apps where this is a white labeled app uh, just for you guys. So instead of your viewers going to the app stores and looking for ScreenWeave, they would go to the app store and look for your exact channel name, which is a little bit more user friendly for your viewers. I forgot there's a video here. I should have talked while I was showing this video. Um, but for the ScreenWeave app, it's pretty easy. Um, they would download the app. They would go in uh, and it would show a list of channels closest to them based off of um, geolocation. Um, and then when they select the channel for the first time, it will then default to going to that channel. Um, and then uh, if you have live streams or video on demand content that's available uh, to watch right on the Apple TV, which we're demoing here on screen right now, um, just go in here and select something and they would be able to watch it. So for example, here you can go in and watch the live stream so if a viewer is outside of your cable reach, they can still watch it 
um, if using the live stream um, or being able to go in here and watching video on demand content. Uh, and the same can be said about the custom apps. Uh, for example, CCX Media has their own very, uh, their very own app in the App Store. Uh, viewers can download it and they'll bring it right to their, their content. Um, so a very nice feature to have uh, to broaden your outreach in today's age of um, Apple TV and Roku channels. Um, again, uh, real quick to reiterate on this, if you have Reflect right now, uh, it is included with that service. So if you are using our Reflect service for live streaming or video on demand, uh, you can use that now. Um, or you can take advantage of that custom application like you saw for CCX Media. Um, it will be your very own app in the store, 1500 for the first year and setup, uh, and then it's $500 a year after that. Um, if you have any questions about that or want to learn more, uh, feel free to email us at sales uh, at cablecast.tv or by going to our website, there's a little chat widget in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, just use that and you can get to us live. Uh, I think that's it for me. I'm going to stop my share and pass it on to the next presenter. Which would be me. Um, so now I got to figure this out. <laughs> I can present for you if you'd like. Yeah, that'd be great. If you could just pop back on, that would be awesome. So, um, so we, we have a partnership with ENCO closed captioning and I um, want to talk about that for a second. So uh, ENCO is one of the, the leader actually in artificial intelligent closed captioning and um, they've partnered with us. They, they're very accurate. They do both live and online uh, live and offline captioning um, with the sidecar files Ray was talking about. They they have the ability to learn local places and names. Um, so a very, very powerful solution. They um, And then they have a number of different options for purchase. Um, so you can buy the system outright and that's, that's one option. Um, and then uh, caption 24 seven if that's what you're interested in. They also have lease options where you basically contract for a specific number of hours per month. And we are offering uh, both uh, options uh, through Cablecast. In fact, we have a specific Cablecast part numbers for these ENCO options. And um, we, um, uh, I mean, afterwards, if you have questions, you can reach out to sales at cablecast.tv and uh, we can get you specific pricing. Um, so we, and we have special pricing and uh, special plans. So um, ENCO offers, uh, traditionally they offer to the broadcast world, they offer either live captioning um, for a specific price. And then if you wanted to add offline captioning, it would be an additional amount and we have an arrangement with ENCO where our customers are able to do both live and offline captioning for the same price uh, for, for the same number of hours, which we will get into when we do the ENCO webinar. Um, and then we also have lower upfront uh, and commissioning costs uh, because we're participating in that along with ENCO. So, um, so a really fantastic deal with ENCO and now um, and now Bill Bennett, who's the media solutions manager for ENCO is gonna tell you a little bit more about the ENCO technology. So hey. Bill, there we are. Hey Steve, hi everybody. Thanks very much. Um, I'm gonna share my presentation here. And uh, you should have it, it looks like, yeah. right? Okay, great. And, and it's funny, it's an interesting product definition. CC does not stand for cable cast, uh, but uh, so, uh, yes, yeah. yes, it does. You just yeah. didn't know it. <laughs> it was it was foreshadowing back in 2005 when we came up with it. And it just things sometimes take a while to align. Um, so I've got nine slides, not too much. Um, I won't get too into the weeds here. Um, 
But yeah, this the the encaption product is uh, and this is kind of what it, what you're looking at when uh, when you use an encaption product. You have a, a computer based environment uh, for its GUI uh, running on a Windows platform, and it's an it's an appliance, uh, one rack high, one rack unit high, typically, um, and it's on premise completely. So it's a pretty self contained product right there. Um, so let me first tell you a little bit about Enco, and then we'll get more into the encaption product. Uh, we've been around since uh, I think 1983 specifically, um, uh, designing uh, broadcast automation and control systems for uh, international broadcasters, uh, radio and television. Uh, since then, um, the uh, so we, we we've definitely understand the workflows of broadcasters, both commercial and public, and peg broadcasters. It's in our blood. Um, the transcriptioning and captioning product uh, called Encaption came back, came out in about 2005. Uh, and like technology in general, it keeps getting better and better and better. Uh, and then we've introduced artificial intelligence to it a few years ago, which itself is just getting better and better. So uh, the accuracies are pretty impressive nowadays. Uh, we're based in Michigan, so, uh, and we have 24 7 uh, telephone support for our customers. Uh, and uh, you know, of course, emails too, if that helps, but uh, sometimes you just need to pick up that phone. Um, the Encaption product, uh, we have hundreds of customers using it now uh, worldwide. Television, radio, like I said, uh, station groups, uh, large and small, uh, in individual stations, uh, large markets, mid markets, small markets, the whole gamut. Uh, municipalities and educational customers, universities um, uh, and secondary uh, learning. Also, uh, commercial television, radio, um, sorry, uh, pub public broadcasters, I mean, uh, and corporate and audiovisual, we're seeing a grow in that regard for, uh, for meetings and applications and live event captioning. So it's really getting uh, some, some neat traction out there. Uh, and we're really, really looking forward to working with you guys uh, to, to grow that further in, in the PEG environment for your, for your uh, residents. Um, Encaption is a, uh, by the way, I didn't start the timer, so now I don't know how late I'm gonna be, but, um, Encaption, it's, a, it's an automated speech to text appliance. And like I mentioned, it's completely on premises, no internet connectivity required. So it's fast, it's reliable. Um, you, you, you can have a cloud connection version uh, if you want it hosted in the cloud. Generally, that's not really, uh, that just things makes things more complicated unless it is needed for your workflow, uh, but it's there if you need it. Uh, the accuracy is really impressive. Uh, it's in the mid to high 90s. Uh, we're seeing 95 to 98% accuracy in general terms. Um, and so that's, especially with the PEG environments, municipalities, uh, and if you have meetings where people have microphones and that's uh, direct audio feed right into it, it's really clean. Latency, uh, only three to four seconds. Uh, generally that's faster than humans can be, especially since you consider the uh, network issues. If you have a human that's captioning from a different location like their homes. Um, and, and as Steve mentioned, it does both real time and file based. So you can use one box to do either one or the other. Um, uh, you can switch back and forth between those modes. Uh, and it's 24 seven fully operational. If you have to have a, um, a meeting that goes over or if you have a, a meeting that's scheduled last minute, uh, then you can just turn it on and use it. Uh, and because it's automated, the more you use it, the more money you save with it. It really is economical because of that AI working for you. Um, <clears throat> so it, it can natively embed six, uh, CEA 608, 708 in captions into an SDI stream or in, uh, SDI signal, or it can control third party encoders if you've already got one. Uh, it can also do opening captions on video passing through it, SDI, NDI, or HDMI. Uh, it, at all the times that it captions, whether it's live or file based, it's creating sidecar transcript files in many different formats. You can just choose which ones you want in the setup. Um, and we also have a neat feature for HTML and web streams, which are useful for streaming captions of your meetings onto smart devices, onto your website, maybe tablets that someone may have with them in the room, or even displaying on monitors inside the room, uh, like open captions, either open captions on active video or just screens dedicated to captions only. I have an example of that coming right up. Um, and again, we, we talked about file based as well. And generally that works by taking files, uh, audio or video clips and throwing it into a watch folder on a, uh, uh, on a network, uh, which means that anybody uh, who has an interest in captioning in your uh, in network environment can add files to it. And then as it captions those offline files, which by the way, is pretty quick, that's two or three times real time in general, uh, they can then grab the transcripts from that and then have transcripts of video they put into the system. Uh, and that's all accessible via, again, the corporate networks that most of your uh, offices have. So um, and it's, just, it's just Windows networking. Um, the, uh, 
one of the other cool things Steve mentioned was the word lists. Uh, there's a few different ways that we manage that. Uh, you can permanently uh, save into the system words that relate to your municipality, uh, names of people, uh, names of companies perhaps that may get mentioned a lot or unique spellings of roads or city uh, cities adjoining yours. Um, you can also have temporary uh, words brought into it by skimming your agenda. If you electronically provide that document to Encaption, Encaption will grab from it unique words that it doesn't know and keeps those in memory so it can access them in real time. Uh, that's kind of a nice way to, to, to you know, do last minute additions of words from an agenda. Uh, we do that with television broadcasters all the time uh, for their teleprompter scripts. We brought, bring that in through an automated method uh, and it, right before the news starts, it grabs the teleprompter script and, and has these extra words that it may need. It, it has around a million words in its dictionary. So pretty much it's got the words that you'll generally need anyway, but it helps to just add a few more words if they're, if they're uniquely spelled. Um, no, no voice training, that's, that's uh, the technology that is no longer, uh, or an element of this technology that's no, lo no longer needed. Um, we can caption several different languages, uh, depending on how we configure the box, and we can also do real-time translations with it too, with a separate different device that we have, so that's kind of interesting as well. Um, the, the product, uh, we unveiled a new feature last year for punctuation detection. Uh, and improvements in our speaker change detection, which indicates new talkers or new, new presenters by Chevrons in the uh, caption uh, stream or caption thread. Um, punctuation's nice because it, uh, it helps make your captions clearer to the viewer so that they not understand when a, a period is there or a comma or a, you know, exclamation point. And you can set those, uh, the, uh, the threshold for those within the settings of our system if you wanna dial that in. Uh, the device can also record audio as a caption, so you can use it as a recorder for the audio passing through it. Uh, and we can use a, uh, a, a technology that we came up with just a few months ago even, is, is a new development is to delay video coming into it uh, to sync it up with the captions almost perfectly so you have a much more natural lip sync to it. So that three or four second delay can even go away. Uh, this is one example. Um, you may have heard of CART, which is a uh, technology uh, for captioning within rooms. Uh, this is one example of using our automated system to do captioning on a computer screen. Uh, in this case, this is actually at the National Association of Broadcasters main stage from last year. And all week uh, in caption ran fully automated. We didn't feed it any words. We did not give it any names of presenters or anything. We just let it run on its own. And that those, uh, the text that you see uh, there is just constantly scrolling like you would see captions on a, uh, a video screen. So, um, uh, and we also do have a, um, uh, an API that you can access this remotely and control, turn it on remotely, schedule it to turn on or turn off when you need it or just through a web browser. Uh, and so, uh, and those captions also, like I said, uh, can be delivered to your website or to a smartphone as well. So it's got a lot of neat functionality and it's always recording the transcripts at the same time as it's captioning. So that's kind of it. I don't want to re repeat too much of what Steve said, but uh, that's the, uh, the Encaption product. We're really looking forward to working with you all. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, we're, we're really excited to be working with you as, as well and um, look, look, forward to, uh, look forward to seeing how our two products can work together and, and working on that uh, going yeah. forward also. Yeah, there we go. I'm just gonna give everyone the details for the upcoming webinar that we're going to be doing um, with ENCO specifically. Uh, so this whole presentation will be dedicated to talking about these solutions, how they work in tandem, um, pricing, hardware, all of the all of the nitty gritty details. So you'll see the link is posted there. I'll also post a live link in the chat. Um, but you can see that's going to be next Thursday at two o'clock Eastern. Uh, so we hope that you all can join us there. Um, I imagine they'll all get an email too at some point. You'll, you'll probably all get an email too. Don't worry, there'll be plenty of, of notifications if you're interested in participating in that. And that is the end of our slides. Thanks you all. Now I know that Bill has to go soon. So um, I think we had one question at least, Grayson, from someone about ENCO, so I want to make sure we just... Yeah, we, we did. We got two that are probably uh, Bill can help us with. Uh, sure the thing. first one was from Dimitri. He was asking about if InCaption works with just English audio or does it support 
Oh, no, lots Other of languages. languages. Yeah, wow. yeah, uh, about 15 uh, languages, uh, including, you know, think Spanish, Japanese. Uh, um, yeah, I actually have a full list if you'd like me to read it off, but it's about 15 or 20 different languages it can caption. Okay. So. No, I'm sure that's good. I think that answers the question. Yeah, Thank you. Cool. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Dimitri. Uh, yeah, the other one we had was from, uh, well, it's from Anonymous, but <laughs> was asking how the uh, ENCO captioning works with thick accents or low quality audio that a human is able to translate. So it, it's designed for, for English um, uh, in the, the whatever language, um, the, the proper version of the language that it's configured for. Um, but we, we have customers all around the United States using it. And there's, of course, a lot of different regional dialects from Boston to the Carolinas or down to you know, Georgia. Um, I don't know if anyone's using it in Fargo with those long O's, but uh, so it's, it's pretty resilient. Um, we, we do have a way of, of sampling some of your vid video. If, if a customer has an example video of some thick dialect from your, one of your meetings, uh, we can do a, a caption uh, test with it and send you back the transcripts. So you can see how that turned out and, uh, and see for yourself. So. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Sure. And Bill, it looks like we had one more come in from Bob here. He was asking if uh, the captioning is editable, editable in post. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend eating it. The, the paper is, it's, if you pen print it, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. It, so the, the uh, files that this creates, the sidecar files, are all simple text files. Um, and, and so they are editable as, I mean, you literally open them up in Notepad. So they are completely editable that way. Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, you bet. All right, good. So if anyone has any other captioning questions, let's make sure to get those in while we still have Bill with us here. Um, I guess me at this point, Bray, I might toss it over to you. I know Brian had a question on Fire TV support with ScreenWeave OTT. Sure, yeah. So uh, Fire TV support is definitely kind of on our radar and on our roadmap. Um, it was something that we were hoping to have ready for NAB, but with the um, like I'm sure most people's uh, schedules right now, uh, got thrown out the window and that one just didn't quite make it for this webinar. Uh, but it's definitely something we're looking at um, as well as a couple other platforms for uh, the screen we have OTT apps and channels. Um, one, I, I had a couple other questions I just wanted to like address while I have the floor for a second. Um, there are quite a few questions about SRT files uh, support in Cablecast sidecar. Um, that's not currently supported the the big long technical reason is that SRT is technically a subtitle format, which it's not pre-encoded as closed captions and therefore isn't necessarily uh, doesn't necessarily conform to closed caption requirements. There's strict requirements about how much closed caption data can be present at any given time. Um, and SRT doesn't have to conform to that because just time code with text data. Um, so we are working on some kind of uh, abilities to deal with that, um, but it's not something that we currently support. Um, and then the other question was about uh, pushing to uh, Facebook and YouTube from uh, your Cablecast hardware. So like your uh, Cablecast live streaming servers or uh, your new Vio or Flex video servers. Um, that was definitely something that I wanted to be able to show you um, at this uh, virtual happy hour. But again, it's one of those things that just kind of got thrown out the window. Um, we kind of pivoted mostly to ScreenWave Live. We really wanted to get that out the door as quickly as possible so that people could start doing their, uh, their meetings entirely remotely and get those broadcast to their customers. Um, there's quite a bit of overlap. We reused a lot of the technology that we were working on to be able to do some of like the uh, push to Facebook and push to YouTube that ScreenWave Live can do. Um, so rest assured that those features will make their way back into Cablecast probably over the next few months. Um, it's just like everyone else, we're a little bit overwhelmed with just the, the rapid state of the world changing. Um, but those are things that we do plan on doing and hope to share with everyone in the near future. And that's all I have for right this second. Give it back to Grayson. Okay. Thanks, Ray. And Bill, it looks like we had a couple more closed caption ones comes in here that hopefully you can help us with. I uh, got another one from Dimitri. He's asking if we can translate closed captioning into English like YouTube does. Uh, translate into English or I mean, we, so we have a translation product called in translate and that does real time translations. Once you caption in one of the languages that uh, the in caption product can, can caption with, 
then in translate is able to translate that into another language in real time. So uh, it's, um, most languages, there's a lot more languages actually within translate that we can translate between two languages. Uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question though. Uh, does, or Dimitri, if it doesn't, please follow up. But yeah, please. that's that's how I interpreted it, Bill. So thank okay, you. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, in Translate right now is a cloud-based product is uh, separate than Encaption. We're working and, and making that into an on-premise port, however. So pretty cool to watch one language uh, in one, you know, maybe English, for example, and then watch it come back on another screen in a different language in real time. It's kind of magical. Universal translator. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is cool. Awesome. Uh, what else we have here? Uh, Baynard's asking us if the file is previously encoded in line 21, does it simply pass through? Uh, I believe the answer to that would be yes, if you already have captioning in your file. Yeah, so line 21 is old style uh, SD analog closed captioning. Um, the caveat there is if you have line 21 captions on your files, Cablecast will pass them through if you're outputting in the same standard definition resolution. If you, uh, if you start to scale that content to different resolutions, uh, it depends on your hardware um, and what version of Cablecast you're on. Uh, but if you have specific questions about that, you should contact us at support because it does depend a little bit on the, exactly what you're doing. But if you're, if you're just going from SD to SD, the line 21 will pass through. Perfect, thanks Ray. Hey, John's asking us if ENCO is dependent on Cablecast 7.1, uh, which I believe the answer to that is no, it's not version dependent on our end. No. There will be in the future some uh, integration between the two products that will probably be in uh, version 7.2 or 7.3, depending mm -hmm. on development timelines. But uh, each product can be used independently, but we are working on some uh, tight integrations, um, specifically like the ability to turn the ENCO in caption box uh, on and off from like say the cable cast force matrix or to automatically schedule that as part of your meeting schedule workflow. Um, the idea between the integration as we move forward is really that cable cast knows about your schedule. It knows what you're doing. Um, it's in charge of all your automation and we want that to kind of do the right thing in regards to closed captioning without having to have our customers do a lot of extra steps. So, in the perfect world, future version of Cablecast, you just configure the ENCO once, and if you schedule something live, it'll automatically route the signal through the ENCO, turn it on, um, all that kind of stuff, and then turn it off when it's done uh, so you don't get charged extra. Um, and it can also manage things like offline uh, caption workflows. And I, I've already been in touch with the ENCO development team, and we're, we're kind of hashing some of that stuff, how it's going to work, and we hope to show it to you at a future date. Awesome. Thank you, Ray. Uh, Bill, we have another one that's kind of on the Enco pr Translate product here. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe you kind of hit on some of this already, but Jason's okay. asking us, is, how many languages can it handle? How is it priced? Is it one language, multi-language? So yeah, pricing, we can get, work with you uh, uh, offline to discuss that. Um, I'm looking at the list of languages right now. I think, I don't have this memorized, but I think about 28 different languages we can translate between. Uh, so, um, and about 15 languages in the in caption product. So uh, in real time, and then we have another, about another additional 15 in offline. So it brings that closer to about 28 or 30 as well. So. Um, Perfect. Yeah, Thank actually, you. I think we have even more than that for the, uh, I won't bore you with counting all these lines, but it's not in a spreadsheet, but it's even more than that that we can translate between. Okay, no, that's yeah, perfect. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's. Most most common popular languages. We're out of questions. Grayson really are. powered through the question queue. <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah, pretty we were, amazing. Well, I had some help too, but yeah. Um, but also I want to remind people that at any point you can be getting in contact with us. I'm getting a, my internet is unstable. I hope you all can still hear me. Um, so, uh, at any point, you all can be communicating with us and also other users, which can be really helpful on our Cablecast user forum. Um, so I've been mentioning it a lot, especially lately, because I know some folks are having to find like really specific workarounds and stuff for remote working or, or just any limitations that you're facing in the current situation. Um, and it can be really helpful to talk to other users about those use cases because sometimes we don't always think about them. 
Um, so I just posted the link in the chat. If you're not already an active member on our community forum, um, really encourage you to join because it's a way, like I said, for you to stay in touch with us, but also with other users all the time, not just at special events like this. So please um, check it out. And that will be one of the links that I will be sharing again in the follow-up. Um, now, Grayson, let's go back to this queue. And then it's technically 502. So if anybody wants to crack a beer at this point, I think we can do that. Well, we were and supposed if, to wait. <laughs> <laughs> uh, apparently not. Does that um, depend on time zone or is it just five o'clock everywhere now? Pandemic, <laughs> it's five o'clock anytime. It anyway. doesn't matter. Right, right, time, right. time is a construct that we don't really need right now. True that. Um, <laughs> um, so I actually had a few of the questions I, I marked I want to answer live um, just because okay. they're cool and fun. Um, okay. So uh, Brian's asking um, about podcasts. And this is really funny because me and uh, JJ, the CEO, were musing about our podcasting support uh, just the other day. And I said, who I'm, would want to do that? That sounds crazy. And I was like, it'd be so cool. And so <laughs> I, I have been thinking about that. And so if you are interested in kind of doing more with podcasts through Cablecast, uh, please kind of reach out to me directly. My harebrained idea at the moment is to save search all the things. Um, and so basically set up a safe search in Cablecast and uh, anything on that safe search would automatically be uh, kind of marked for VOD and then automatically kind of uh, made available as a podcast feed. Um, and then on the Cablecast public site or through the API, you could basically get a list of all the, the podcast feeds. Um, there is a very buried feature somewhere in Cablecast where a I was gonna project- I say like the ironic thing is like Cablecast three did that and I wrote that in like, you know, like totally. 2001. And, it, <laughs> and I've had to maintain it for the last 10 years and some people still use it. Um, specifically, I know Trent Comer, who I think is still on the call. He's the only one that I know of that reports bugs whenever I break podcasting. But it's it. definitely something I think would be uh, fun to make better and uh, is definitely something where I think Cablecast could really shine. Um, so uh, the other question, I already sort of alluded to this, but is um, uh, from another direction, but is there a way to take a file from Cablecast and directly upload it to our YouTube channel? Um, not yet, uh, but that is definitely something um, we are looking at doing and it, it's, it is on our roadmap. So just, uh, just know that it is something we are looking into. Um, and then finally from Nick, uh, he was asking, um, is there ability to record a network stream? So if you watch my 7 webinar, you'll, you'll uh, hear me tell you that uh, the way you can record a network stream right now is by playing it out your video server and then routing it into the encoder. Um, the technical reasons for that is that we support a lot of different network streams that aren't necessarily all compatible with the same encoding like container. So we can't just capture all of them and dump them into the same type of file. Um, and so we're still working on how to auto detect what types of streams we can put in what types of files and then be able to capture those directly without tying it up a, a decoder encoder. Uh, but it is something we're working on. We're hoping to have it as part of 7.2 uh, in the next few months. Sure, well, thanks everybody for joining us for the, the presentation. Hopefully next year, we will be able to do this with you again in Las Vegas. So see you then.